Great. So I like the unconference sessions. They can be a bit more chilled out. Yeah. Um, so how we're going to do this is I'm going to talk a little bit more about what is peer review, what we should be thinking before you do a peer review, and then Laura's going to take on the kind of what the do's and don'ts and how you can, can do a good peer review. And so I suppose the first thing we should probably talk about is, well, what is peer review? So obviously, peer review is when other experts in the field um, uh, who do the same work as you verify uh, the work that you've done to ensure that it can go forward and be published in the literature and that others could start to look at it and, and rebuild it. So normally this is done by a publisher. So um, mm -hmm. we kind of uh, select or we have editors uh, in some journals, they have editors who select reviewers to review your paper. Uh, some, sometimes they will ask you to suggest uh, people to peer review your paper because obviously you have the domain uh, knowledge as well. But the idea is that, yeah, they're giving a verification um, of, of the work and helping you improve it to make it to a standard that you can publish it. And so peer review, I mean, it, can, it does get a bad rap. Everyone uh, has something bad to say about peer review and, and, and good. But realistically, this is, this is the best quote I've seen for what peer review should be, and it's kind of my idealistic view of what peer review should be. Uh, and it's basically, in an ideal world, peer review should be an open, supportive, and collaborative process by which a group of independent scientists assess the quality of a body of research. Isn't that nice? Uh, this, isn't how it, this isn't how it happens. But this is, this is what it, how it should happen. Um, so I'm just going to go through the, the, probably the four biggest uh, types of peer review that you can get, um, uh, particularly in biomedical science at least. Uh, so we'll start off with single blind, so this is the most common. So this is when you as the author don't know the reviewer, but the reviewer knows who you are. So uh, there's some pros and cons of that that, that we can, that we can uh, talk about later. There's the double blind review, where the reviewer doesn't know who you are, and you don't know who the reviewer is. Again, there's pros and cons. I, that, that's not too popular in, in biomedical um, research. There are a few journals that do it. Um, I think the biggest um, thing around this is even though you don't know who each other, the reviewer can definitely tell who you are by the yep. citations you've yep. got in your references. It's so it's, it's kind of flawed. Um, yeah. Open peer review. So open peer review is becoming, uh, is the next big thing I would say in a review. So there's a lot of journals now who are doing it. Uh, and it's the idea that the reviewers reveal their identity, hence providing a more constructive review and helping maybe make the process a little more collaborative. Um, so that's, that's graining in popularity. And then there's post-publication peer review. So obviously this morning I talked about the F1000 model, but there's also sites now where you can review papers that have already been peer reviewed. So a lot of people are now using commenting sites to, to discuss work further. So I would say that they, these are the main kinds of peer review that we have. Um, but what the big issue around peer review is, it's a, it's a human endeavour. So uh, it's all, we're, we're weird creatures, humans, uh, and we are always got some sort of bias, uh, um, some subjective and objective biases. And peer review itself is more of an art, it's more of a uh, well-crafted report about discussing somebody's work. And so when you start bringing in opinions and, and your own biases, things can happen. Uh, peer review in general is a disorderly process. Uh, it's, it's governed by publishers and, and re realistically the goal sometimes is to get the paper reviewed and not necessarily doing it uh, by getting the right people in the right place. Uh, it's driven by subjectivity, so obviously you can look at things and be like, oh, they're doing a similar work to me, um, I should be extra critical, shouldn't I? These things go on. Uh, it's fallible to mistakes, uh, just because a reviewer thinks that it's wrong doesn't necessarily mean it is. Uh, and one of the issues with peer review is you can't really contest uh, some of these things. And, you know, even the, in the seedy kind of things, that there has been cases where it's open to abuse. So there's been uh, what, what was called a peer review cartel, where there was lots of people working together to review each other's work to ensure that they got cited. And, yeah. and so it can be gamed. So there's lots of things about peer review that you should, you should uh, realise before, before embarking upon it. Uh, and so he, these are a few things that I think are worth considering. So being asked to be a peer reviewer, I think, is a big privilege. It means somebody, either a colleague in your field or a journal editor or a publisher, has recognised that you are skilled in a certain area 
and they would like your input on a certain article. That's a privilege. That's that's impact in my in my mind. So um, you'll often hear some people complaining that they have too many things to peer review, and that can happen. And, and realistically, you know, there's not much credit going in towards them as we discussed this morning. But I think it's a privilege to be asked to peer review. Um, the most important thing to do is to review the quality of the science. So again, try and box those subjective opinions and uh, if you see it's from a certain lab or someone that you met at a conference and you had a coffee with and you thought, I don't really like them, you've got to put that to, a, to one side and you've got to just base it upon the actual quality of the research. Um, you should also, when you know a lot of the time, you do do know who the author is. The, then you will be able to see where they're. You'd be able to see if they're a PI or a young researcher. You'd be able to see if they're male or female. You'd be able to see what they've published before. And so all these things can sometimes affect what you're doing. You've got to again box that, and you've got to uh, again just co concentrate on the quality of the research. And the thing is, yeah, you must be objective. If you've already started thinking about this guy who was a really you know, annoyed you about the coffee at the conference, you shouldn't probably be doing a review on his work. You have to, you have to remain impartial. And so I'm, I'm a big proponent of open peer review. Um, I have been for a long time. And so I thought, uh, as I've just discussed, I think we are moving into an era of fairer peer review and, and uh, more and more we're looking at how to credit it. And I do think it will become a part of how you as a researcher is evaluated in the future. And so I just thought I'd go through a few of the force and against open peer review. And again, this is probably something we can talk about uh, later on because there are lots more reasons. But for, for open peer review, I think uh, these are the benefits. It shows that you have an informed opinion of the work. Again, you could be judged on that apparent, uh, if, if someone like the ref wanted to, uh, to look at that. Uh, it demonstrates experience as a reviewer and, and experience as a, as a researcher. You can get credit for your work because people can see that you've done it. Um, People who read the paper can put your comments in context with the paper and get a, a general, more broader view of the research. Uh, it can reduce bias because everyone knows who's who. And as I've seen, I've, I've worked in both open and post, closed peer review and the reviews are so much more constructive in, in open peer review. Mm. I, had one ish, uh, I had one case where someone thought it was going to be a closed peer review. <laughs> they sent it in and it was like, this work is rubbish. I can't believe you would publish this and that kind of ilk, and then I sent them an email saying, you do realise this is going to be an open peer review? And they were like, oh, okay. And it came back completely different. <laughs> So-and-so might want to try, and it was much more <laughs> constructive, and it was much more helpful, <coughs> but, you know, it, I think that only happened because they had to put their name to it and had to be seen um, to be being more constructive. Uh, there are some things that are against open peer review, so retribution or revenge is the big one I hear, so if you tell Professor X that his work isn't good enough and you're a young researcher, people think that then they will remember you forever and then when you come up for tenure they'll look at your name and they'll go, I remember that review I got from them. <laughs> They're not going to get this grant. I'm not sure how much that happens, but that is a big concern. Um, it can have, yeah, like I say, it can have repercussion for younger students. You don't actually want to be seen. Um, you know, when a professor has done some work and you want to get some points across, they can exercise some sort of, uh, well, I've been in the game longer than you kind of thing. So you have to be careful and you don't, you don't want to really uh, upset anyone. Uh, open peer review can, uh, people say that it can sometimes facil facilitate a club mentality. So I scratch your back, you scratch mine because you reviewed me before, so I'll review you. And then um, it's also people don't want to be negative towards colleagues, even though that they are behind their back. So I think you might as well do it in the open anyway. So uh, I'd like to talk a little bit more about that later on when we do the questions, but I'm going to hand over to Laura now, who's going to tell you how to do the perfect peer review. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Michael. I don't know about perfect, but <laughs> peer review, first of all, I mean, let me just say that this, um, you know, this is really about spotlighting good research with good practices. So it doesn't matter how good the research is, if your peer review is not also good, it may stop it getting out there in the world. So let's just think about some do's and don'ts, some tips. First up, um, be timely and plan ahead. Now what I mean by that is if someone um, sends you an invite, get back to them promptly. Keep in touch with the editorial office if necessary, 
but it is, as Michael said, it's a privilege to be asked. Don't keep them waiting. Please be timely if you are invited. Even if it's a no, that's totally fine, but get back to them. Um, and plan ahead. It does take time to do a good review. You will need to build in an actual block of time in your calendar when you're going to do this ahead of the deadline that you've been set. Make sure you do it because it is really worthwhile and you will be the darling of every publisher if you get your review on time. Believe me. We know that academics have thousands of conflicting deadlines. We get it. But it's the author waiting as well. The research is waiting to get out in the world. The more efficient you are, the better the whole process is. Second, stay in scope and focus on the science. So you're an expert in the field, sure. You're working your research. And maybe you want to see this reviewer, as, sorry, as a reviewer, you want to see this paper do a bit more. You know, like, come on, what about this bit that I've picked up on? That, you know, why haven't you picked up on this? Please recognise the author has their own scope that they've set. It may not be your scope, it's their scope. Just review their scope. Don't try and take them off, don't force them to add references that they, they, they're not relevant to what they're actually doing. And when I say focus on the science, I don't just mean the scope of the science, I also mean if they've got little objective errors like spelling, grammar, don't worry, the copy editor will take care of that, that's what publishers are for. Okay? You don't have to copy edit the thing, just make sure the science is sound. All right, does that make sense? Okay, next point. Be constructive, not destructive. Obviously, Michael's already touched on this. Professional courtesy, folks. It's what it's all about. And really, honestly, it's karmic as well. You get out what you put in. Um, so if you give good reviews to people, they will know who you are, regardless of whether it's double blind or not, and you will get it back. Um, so be polite, be impersonable, impersonal, and where possible, make, suggest reasonable improvements. So what you're aiming for here is collaborative improvement of a paper that you take on to review. You want that paper to go out there being the best it can be, thanks to you, right? That's the aim. All right, next point, um, organise your comments. So first of all, if there are major points for revision that you think really this cannot go to, go to, go to publication without resolving these points, structure those first. Then if you have more minor comments about rephrasing something to make it clearer or whatever, then structure them in the minor comments below. And in both cases, please be precise exactly what you mean, give examples, give references if necessary. Um, it's really helpful to the author. Think about what you would want to get back. If, if you were thinking about these comments and you had to read this, you know, not knowing who the reviewer was, not knowing what the context is, would it make sense to you? If not, clarify it better. Um, also, consider field specifics. Um, so this is something that I think I cannot emphasise enough. doesn't happen enough in peer review, particularly with statistics. Um, if you are an expert enough to understand the controls, the statistics, uh, the da data methods, comment on it. It's so valuable. Um, give, give your expertise from your side um, if you have that specific um, value, because I tell you now, the publisher doesn't. Um, the publisher cannot possibly be an expert in every paper they publish. That's why we need you. So please, think about the specifics of the methodology, the results. Can you comment on that? Can you really say how, how, how representative this is, for example, statistically or whatever? Be really, really helpful. And finally, if it's good, say so and say why. You do not have to tear down a paper because you're reviewing it. You're not there to find the faults. If you want to say, this paper is going to break ground in this field, I have never seen anything so brilliant. Um, you know, this is going to be the next you know, Nature paper, Springer paper, whatever, that, that's going to go on the New York Times. Fine, say it, great. The publisher will be delighted to hear that, and so will the author, believe me. Um, then this, these are sort of the, the main things that you should be thinking about doing a peer review, but there are just a few more tips I want to share. Um, what else can you consider? First of all, you can say no. Um, as I said before, be prompt in your response to any invitation you receive, but be honest if the invitation is outside your expertise. If you feel a bit uncomfortable um, with what they're asking of you, sometimes publishers don't quite marry up the expertise beautifully, sometimes handling editors don't either. It's not their fault, they're just maybe a bit short on who to ask. If, it, if you can't do it, have the courtesy, if you know someone who can, please suggest alternative reviewers. It is so helpful. It keeps the process moving much, much faster. Again, it's relying on that expertise from you. Um, and as I said before, respond quickly and keep in touch. So it, it, throughout the peer review, if, if you're going to be delayed or something, let the publisher know. Really appreciate that. Um, concise is good, but vague or one line is bad. 
Okay, so concise, yes, don't waffle on. No one needs three pages of revisions um, in, in, from a reviewer, but you know, the kind of the one liner, yeah, publish it. Mm, thanks. Um, you know, neither the author nor the publisher actually knows what that means. So do be precise as you can. Fi uh, but al almost to my final point honesty is valuable. So in some forms of peer review, you will have comments for the author and comments for the editor as separate sections. And this means that the comments to the editor may not be disclosed to the author. However, please bear in mind, if that is the case, don't hide the negative comments for the editor only. It is beneficial to the author to know why you're recommending for rejection, if you are recommending for rejection. Okay? Write it in a courteous and professional way. You know, as, as, as Michael gave you an example, you know, so-and-so might consider revising in this way. But right now, I do not think this is appropriate for publication. Yeah, but don't hide that for the editor only. Make sure the author knows why. And obviously, please be clear, are you recommending, yes, publish this, or are you saying, mm, sorry, not right now, maybe another version of this manuscript? Please do make sure they know what your final decision is. Don't just list your comments. And then, just as a recap here, why are we doing this? To make research shine. Um, so the aim of peer review should always be, first, filter out sh bad science. You know, um, if, you, if it shouldn't be in the stream of knowledge, tell us so. Stop it at the source. However, for everything else, we should be aiming to collaborate to make each paper the best it can be, improve it as it goes. And, of course, your role is sitting between the author and the deciding editor as the reviewer. You need to help both of them understand what's needed. Okay, I think that's it from both of us. So now I'm very happy to turn over to you for some questions. Thanks very much.